morning, church. What better place to be on a beautiful, sunny Father's Day than in the house of the Lord? It is a joy to worship together this morning. And Benjamin, uh, thank you again for that prelude and the reminder that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us choose to rejoice and be glad in it. As we gather for worship this morning, I just want to mention a couple of important things so that you can be prepared. The first is we will be in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, so if you want to mark your Bibles and be prepared, I encourage you to do so. The second important announcement, as evidenced by the weather this morning, summer is upon us, it's a beautiful sunny day, and we are in our summer hymnal uh, beginning last week, or as of last week. So if you're looking for the hymns in the big blue book, you're not going to be with us. So grab the small book when we sing hymns this morning so that you can make a joyful noise to the Lord in unison with us. So as we gather this morning, let me call us to worship with these words from the psalmist. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. Sisters and brothers, let us worship our Lord. together as we pray the prayer of confession found in our bulletin. O oh God, you hear the brokenhearted. 
Save us from sin when we inflict pain on our neighbors. We bear grudges against those who deceive us. We seek revenge on those who hurt us. Some we judge inferior since they don't meet our standards. Others we deem unworthy of our respect and support. Jesus had compassion upon all who were afflicted. Forgive us, O God, when our hearts are hardened against neighbors in need. Father hears the desires of our hearts. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Father's Day Sunday as we celebrate our Father's love and grace and mercy. I want to remind you about the connection card that is attached to your bulletin. Please tear that off, fill it out, let us know what you're interested in. On the back is an opportunity to share prayer, concern, or praise. Just um, fill that out if you check confidential. Only the pastors will see your prayer request. Otherwise, our elders, deacons, and prayer ministers will pray over those in the next uh, 32 hours. We also uh, have a connection card for all of you that are online watching us, and we're so glad to have you with us today. You can find the connection card above the live feed. Just click on the button, and it will uh, pull down a connection card for you. I want to point out just some really great things coming our way, and um, anytime we talk about an event, you can, you can sign up for it on our website. The website is also a great place to, to learn more about our church, so we hope that you will do that. We are in the midst of a summer series in the Gospel of Luke, and we're pairing that with our summer read called Undistracted by Bob Goff. This is the study guide. Um, we sold out of his books, but they are on Amazon and ChristianBooks.com, so we hope that you'll um, pick yours up and uh, start, start reading it if you haven't already. This study guide will take you through the whole book and um, the Gospel of Luke as well. Um, so you don't have to read the book, but it might be helpful to read the book. So we hope that this will be a blessing for you. If you're looking for a group and haven't connected to a community group that is doing this study, I'd be glad to do that. Just call, talk to me after the service today. Also coming up is um, our FPC 101. This is a wonderful opportunity for folks who've been visiting our church who want to know more about it. Um, it's next Sunday, June the 26th from 3 to 7. 
um, child care is provided. We have dinner, and it's a great opportunity to meet uh, other folks that are interested in the church and find out how you can use your gifts to be a part of the life of our congregation. So we hope that you will come and be a part of that. And also inside your bulletin today is an insert about Vacation Bible School. It is just around the corner. It's in the evenings, July 10th, 11th, and 12th. You'll see the VBS faculty for the adult class and also the menus um, for, for each night. And then on the back is an opportunity to learn more about what our kids are doing and to sign up and volunteer. So we hope that you'll plan to be with us those three nights. It is a super treat to be able to eat together, to learn together, and then have some really good sugar after it's all over. So um, please come and be a part of that. I'd like to call on Joel Phillips now to introduce some of our newest members. Yeah, so one of the great joys in our family of faith is when we grow, and I'm going to invite the England family to come up um, so I can introduce them to you. Um, Leslie and Brendan and their sons, Franklin and Nathan, um, recently joined the church, and um, we want to welcome them. So as we do, we have a gift um, for you as you join the church. There's one for you. Here's one for you. Um, we call this our towel of servanthood. And these words of Jesus reflect our desire to grow in our relationship with Christ by seeking to serve one another and to serve the world. As Jesus says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So we hope that you display that in your home and are reminded of what it means to seek and serve Christ. And so with that, am I doing the greeting? Yeah, I will do the greeting. So let's welcome Leslie and Brendan, Franklin and Nathan, as we stand and greet one another and greet the England family and welcome them into our family. Yeah. Welcome. Jonah, do you 
you know where Jesus was when they got back to Jerusalem? Hold on, hold on. I know which kids to call on for which questions. In the temple? Yes. And was he stressed? No. Not at all. And he was like, how come you wouldn't know where I was, right? And so I started thinking about why I lost Arlie, and that's going to be okay, but losing the Savior of the world is a really big deal, right? And I'm starting to think about, like, where do I lose Jesus in my life? Where do I get so busy that I forget to check on Jesus and I forget Jesus and forget to ask him to check on me? And sometimes I do. You know, you get so busy with school and playing games that you forget about Jesus. And we never want to do that today. So we want to remember not to be distracted, and we want to learn more on how we can not lose Jesus in our life. So I'm going to close this in prayer, and we're going to go to Children's Church, and Joel is going to tell the grown-up version. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for all the dads in this room, Lord, and thank you for all the dads that can't be here today, Lord, and especially we thank you for our Heavenly Father. And we are so thankful to be here today and to learn how we can not be distracted and how we can learn to not lose Jesus in our life. In your heavenly name, amen. amen. All right, all the kids that would like to go to Children's Church can come with me, and if you're new, you can send your kids, and I will bring them back in a safe manner. I know I said a lost lecture, but I did want them. So come on. Come on, kiddos. Let's go. So for those of you who couldn't see the front row, I won't tell you who um, raised their hand for the who has been lost by their parents' question. We'll leave that one um, between them and the Lord. Uh, so, so good morning, uh, church. It is truly uh, great to be together in worship this morning, and I am excited about this series that we're in as we look at undistracted living and we're in the Gospel of Luke um, throughout these coming weeks. And um, it's, it's my hope as we focus on what it means to live an undistracted life, that we discover a season where we find the courage to identify these things that distract us from seeking Christ in our daily lives. And so with that, this morning, we have this passage in the Gospel of Luke. So as I said, um, Luke chapter 2, and it's the story that, um, it's the only story of Jesus between his birth and his public ministry. So we have a lot of uh, text in the Gospels about the, the birth of Jesus and the infancy gospel, we call it. And then later on when he's baptized and begins his public ministry. But there's not much. In fact, there's only this one passage about his childhood. And so a really interesting um, text for us this morning. So with that, uh, let's just dive right in and, and see what is in it for us today. So Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 41 says this. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and their friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, Jesus asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we come to this text this morning, I'd like for us to consider a question for ourselves. As I grow older and hopefully, perhaps more wise, I find myself asking this question of others and myself, why do you do what you do? 
Why do you do the things you do? In our day-to-day living, um, as we witness tragedy after tragedy unfold on the news, we find ourselves asking, why did this person do this thing? Why did they do what they do? If you are searching for um, beauty and encouragement, I encourage you to ask a teacher why they do what they do. Or find a, a NICU nurse who devotes hours and exhaustion and so much of their lives and ask them why they do it. Or a firefighter who runs into burning buildings. Why do you do the things you do? The, the heart of this, the root is, what are your motivations? What are your drives? What, when you get out of bed in the morning, drives you through your day? In essence, what is your mission statement in life? If you have a mission statement, that is. Um, Our church mission statement here, as I said earlier, uh, is to seek Christ and to share his love. And that mission statement reflects our desire as a congregation to grow in our relationship with Christ and then reflect his love into our relationships with each other and our relationships with the world. That is why we do what we do. So why do you do what you do? Um, As I said, I'm excited about this Undistracted series. uh, Many of you um, who know me probably realize this, but I often find myself easily distracted. Um, I have my whole life struggled with focus and and staying on task. And so I'm hoping perhaps in this this summer maybe we'll solve those 38 years of of challenges, or at least I can um, grow a little bit in that. But um, I've tried so many things. I've sought planners and calendars and agendas and the seven habits of uh, all of that stuff. Um, but I've found the things that work are the things that are simple. In fact, the simpler it is, the better. So um, I've brought this this morning. This is my current way of keeping myself focused. It's one sheet of paper, and each day I get up and I start at the very top with the th- three things I want to accomplish for the day. So before my head hits the pillow tonight, I want to cross these things off. These will be done. And then there's a column where I can block out my time so I can keep myself on track and I can ensure that I'm I'm honoring my family time and doing all those things, so I've got that there. And then there's a column here on the left, which is vital for me. It's called my brain dump. And so throughout the day, as emails pop up, as calls come in, as things uh, pop into my mind that would normally draw me off task, I jot them down and they're there and I can come back to them tomorrow or later and I've got that there, but the three things are before me throughout the day. So that's it, so I I have this planner, but I realize that the key to success in this, it's useless unless I'm able to discern and to decide what those three things are. What are my three accomplishments for this day that I've been given? And in order for me to determine that, I need to know the answer to this question, why am I doing what I'm doing? What is my motivation? What is my mission statement? What is my my drive? So I have to ask this question daily, why do I do what I do? And so as we we look at this text today, we ask this question, and um, I can't help but ask, why do Mary and Joseph do what they do in this story from Jesus' childhood, and why does Jesus do what he does? We've got this this moment of tension and conflict in in the family. Um, Why do the the people in the story do what they do? So we start from the beginning, right? They travel to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Why do they do that? Well, um, we can look in the Old Testament and in the customs and traditions, and we, we realize that Jewish law outlines requirements for observing festivals. And there's also requirements for how often and in which way and, and traveling to Jerusalem and how that works. So that's all there. It's, it's required. We're told in the text that they do it every year. It's a routine for them. So why do they do it every year? Mary and Joseph are devoted to the law. They're devoted to God. They're pursuing holiness. They're seeking to live sacrificially, to honor God in what they do. They're seeking to fulfill righteousness in accordance with the law. 
So we have this festival, they're there for eight days, and they begin to travel home after the festival is over, and they travel in a caravan, in a large group of people, most likely from their hometown, their relatives, their family, um, but they make the journey together. Why do they do that? Why travel in a group? Well, there's safety in traveling. It's a four to five day journey for them, so it makes sense for them to travel in large numbers. They can share resources, they can watch each, other ki uh, each other's kids and, and things. The, the women probably traveled in the front, so the women and children, and then the men behind, and in groups and families. And so you can see how it's easy for them to not notice that Jesus is with them. There's this large group of people. But meanwhile, this traveling, they leave this first day, and Jesus remains behind in the temple. He's there listening, he's asking questions, he's engaging in discussions with these wise rabbis and scholars. And so after a full day of walking, the caravan stops and Mary and Joseph then realize that Jesus is not with them. And in a frenzied panic, anxiously, they begin searching and they hurry back to the city and they search high and low for days and days. They search the streets, probably the market, the shops, they're searching this large, crowded city, until finally they find him. They find Jesus in the temple courts with these rabbis, and we come to this profound moment in scripture, perhaps one of the most profound, outside of Jesus' death and resurrection. Profound because Jesus is essentially faced with the question, why do you do what you do? The boy Jesus is found by his mother in the temple. She's no doubt worried sick, she's exhausted. She has that look that if you've ever uh, disappointed your mother, you know that look of, of disappointment, of exhaustion, but relief at finding Jesus. And she questions him by saying, how could you do this to us, Jesus? Your father and I have been worried sick, searching for you. Why did you do this, essentially, why does Jesus do what he does? And Jesus responds. He responds with surprise at their searching. He says, didn't you know? Didn't you realize that I must be here in my father's house? Where else could I be but in the house of my father, about the business of my father in heaven? Now, some Bibles, our translation today says, in my father's house, other translations offer the phrase to be about my father's business or about my father's affairs. But the fact is, in Jesus' response in the original text, he doesn't use the word house or business. The phrase that he answers with is more like, it is necessary, it's I must, I have no choice but to be with and about my father. It's intimate. It's more than just saying, I must be in this specific place at this specific time, doing this specific task, having this conversation. I must always be about the business of my father. So this question, why does Jesus do what he does, can be answered by saying there's nothing else he can do other than to be about the affairs and the business of his father in heaven. All that Jesus does is about his father's business. And so with that in mind, we return to this question for ourselves. And I encourage you today, it's a difficult question to wrestle with, but to ask yourself, really, earnestly, why do you do the things that you do? On a daily basis, do you do things to gain favor with people, or to gain status in society, or in your workplace, or to achieve or attain the next level? Do you do the things you do to be popular or because they're the popular choice? Do you do the things you do out of boredom? There's nothing else to do. Or um, as I can definitely relate to, out of distraction. The things pop up and I react. The things pop up and I react. This email comes in and I go from one to the next and the next. Or um, do you do things simply out of routine? The daily living of life that just goes as it goes, 
and you just do the things that you do as you've always done. Or a great temptation for us is to go with the crowd, to go with the, my group, my people, to do what everyone else is doing because everyone else is doing it. And as we reflect on these types of motivations, we realize that these are the motivations and the things that the world pushes upon us that say, this is how you should live your life. And these things, this gaining status, this achieving, this whatever it is, will often lead to disappointment or dis discouragement. And that's because these pursuits, for the most part, are like chasing a vapor in our lives. It's like grasping for a mist that isn't there, that the tighter you try to grasp and the more you try to reach, the faster it dissipates. Now, I encourage you, on the other hand, to reflect on the seasons in your life of great joy, the seasons of great fulfillment, the times in which you realize that you were seeking only to be in the presence of Christ, that you were seeking only to be about the business of God the Father, these moments of seeking Jesus and nothing else, and experiencing and sharing his love. And as we reflect on those moments, we realize that those are the moments that Jesus is present, that we find him. And as I was reflecting on this this week, the, the very first person that popped into my mind was the great reformer Martin Luther. So for those of you who are students of history, you'll know uh, that Martin Luther was one man who in the 1500s completely altered and changed the course of world history forever. He had a profound and uh, course-altering impact on the church. And all that he did, he did simply to the glory of God the Father. He spoke out against abuses of, in the church at the time. He boldly declared that the church leadership was living unbiblical lives and that they were living lives that were not seeking Christ and they were dragging the church down the same path with them and leading them astray. And he risked life and limb to publish works condemning these actions. He translated the Bible into common language. He wrote commentaries. He wrote devotionals. He, he published these statements that called the leaders of the church to account. Essentially what he did was he put all on the line. He risked his own life simply to be about the business of his heavenly father. He called the church to turn back to Jesus. And eventually this caught up to him in April 1521 as he was called to account for his actions by the church leadership at the time. He was placed on trial for heresy for the things he had published and those who presided over the trial demanded that he recant the statements that he made against the church leadership and he recant the statements he published in his writings. And in that moment, in that room, he responded in this way, boldly declaring, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures and by clear reason, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted. My conscience is captive to the word of God I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against the conscience. May God help me. Amen. And witnesses that were there tell us that in that moment the room erupted and there was this outrage and just this big commotion. And it's in that moment that Luther boldly declared the most famous phrase for those of you who have studied Luther. He said, here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And so as we look at Luther's life, we ask the question, why did he do it? Why did Martin Luther do all that he did? Because he simply could not do otherwise. It was necessary for him to be completely about the will of his father and nothing else. And so today, in this very room, in, in the life of our church, as, as we seek Christ and we seek to serve, we witness firsthand many of you here who have done amazing and selfless things that can only be described as being about the business of God, our Father. 
from Sunday school teachers who impact lives of our children to youth leaders who do the same, who give up their time to pour into our, our, our youth, those who go on mission trips locally and around the world who give up time and money and sacrifice, put their bodies on the line even to work and to serve, and all of the outreach that we do, resettling refugees, the, the international work that we participate in, all of this can only be described as the work of God, our Father. And many of you here have witnessed the impact that hosting Nest in the winter of 2020 has had on those we serve, but also those who served along with us. And I'm really excited. Uh, Rachel Cropper from the URC has recently begun interviewing guests that have stayed with us and have had life-changing impacts from that, but also interviewing volunteers as well in an effort to show the world, to proclaim that there is a presence of Christ in serving one another in this way. And so recently I had the privilege of sitting in on one of these interviews as Rachel talked to a volunteer um, who has served in, in, in this, this way. Um, and this volunteer was here from the very start. So night after night in 2020 as Nest was with us, she began to show up and, and to return regularly. And then last summer when the shelter closed here and moved to the bus station and we set up tents, she still continued to show up week after week. And then the shelter moved yet again to its current location in a hotel. And still, she shows up week after week, month after month, having been dedicated to the guests, to these relationships, to pouring into, into her call to serve in this way. And so Rachel asked her many questions, things like, what was the most unexpected thing you experienced as you began? Or an important question, what are some misconceptions that people have about the homeless community and, and what you're doing? So the interview went on, and then finally, it came to my favorite question. Rachel asked her, why do it? Why do you continue to show up day after day, week after week, month after month, going on year after year? And in one short sentence, the answer came, God has given me certain talents. They are not for me to hold on to, but to give. In essence, I can do no other. That seeking to grow in Christ's likeness, we must be about our Father's business, in our Father's house, because that is where we find Jesus. And so this question, why do you do what you do? So it's June 2022, we all wake up each day and see the same news. We see daily re reports of shootings, tragedies, of violence, of things that don't make sense. We see daily reports of continued inflation, rising gas prices, no baby formula available. The war in Ukraine rages on, more and more people are displaced. ISIS is seeking to regain control in Afghanistan. There's trials, there's politics, there's social issues, there's this, are you on this side or are you on that side? It goes on and on and on, and it's exhausting, and it's distracting. And with all that is going on around us on a daily basis, there's a great temptation to just react, to wake up, see the report, to react, to see the report, to react, to this thing, react to go with the crowd that's the loudest, to go with the opinion that's popular, to go with the majority, to whatever it is, there's this temptation to just react. Or perhaps a greater temptation for some is to just tune it all out, to just wake up and say, I'm gonna put my head down, I'm gonna stay in my lane, I'm gonna do my thing, I'm gonna go about my business, I'm just gonna keep doing what I do and keep doing what I do and I'm just gonna keep my head down. But I sincerely urge you this morning to consider this question, to stop, to look up, and to say, why is it really that I do the things that I do? And a good place to start, perhaps, for you is maybe just take a look at your daily schedule, your daily planner, how you order yourself, how you organize your days, to take note, to reflect, and to evaluate, and to take note of the places 
where you witness the presence of Jesus, where you're called to be about your Father's business. To take notes. To ask, why do I do continually the things that I do? But in this, a word of caution and, and a, a key as you ask this question. That as you look at your list and as you ask yourself, why do I do what I do? I guarantee that there will be things that you do out of boredom, that you do out of distraction, out of reaction. There will most likely be things that you do to gain popularity, to gain favor, to gain whatever, to gain. There'll be things you do to go with the crowd. Those things will be there. And I can, with almost complete certainty, guarantee that there will be things that you do just because that's what I've always done. Because it's my routine. That's my daily motion of life. I don't know why I do it. I just do it. But as you set your three tasks, your three things to accomplish for the day, or however you organize that, as you plan your time, I encourage you to let those things, the boredoms, the distractions, the gaining, the striving, the whatever it is, the routines, to let those things fall aside for a moment and to instead to seek first the kingdom of God in your day and to remember that to remember always that God has given you certain gifts, certain talents, has blessed you abundantly. But the key is that it's not for you to hold on to, but to give freely. To give freely as you seek the presence of Christ and you seek to share His love in a world that so desperately needs it. And in so doing, in seeking Christ in this way, you will abide in your Father's house and you will be about your Father's business. Because that's where Jesus is. He can be nowhere else. In Jesus' name, amen. As we reflect on God's love and word for us this day, I encourage you to... Um, prepare for our offertory, or our offering. Um, we have baskets on the floor near the center aisle, and would love for you to place your connection card in there, as well as your tithes and additional offerings. If you'll pass the basket down your pew and let it land on uh, the outside aisle, our um, readers will come by and pick those up. Um, and it is such a privilege to respond to God's word and love um, each Sunday. Also, if you are watching online, you can also participate in our offering. You can find the button above the live feed that says give, or you can use text to give, and that number is 757-530-5683. Type in the word give, the amount you'd like to give, send the text, and it will walk you through the giving process. So let us continue to worship our awesome God. <laughs>
joy, a privilege it is to give of ourselves, to give of our resources for your purpose alone. We pray that you would take these monies and our commitments and use them as you see fit to extend your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we move into a time of prayer, we want to to pray for peace and joy in our world, especially prayers um, in places where Christians are persecuted, where there's violence rising, where there's suffer, suffering. We pray for God's hand of grace and peace to be on those places and on those places in our own hearts. We want to continue to pray for our senior pastor, Jim Wood, and his wife, Cheryl, as they have been working with Ukrainian refugees in Poland, Lithuania, and Spain. I think they're still in Spain today. We also want to lift up our Joy Village kids who have birthdays this month. We want to celebrate the birth of Sharon and Lyobi and Catherine and John K and Joseph M and Patrick and James and Burton and Phyllis and Joseph there are two Joseph M's. There's Joseph M. W. and Joseph M. Um, John G. and Samuel M. and Martin. We are so very glad for their lives, for the gifts that God has given to them, and we pray for them and their mamas, um, the Joy Village in Kenya. If you want to know more about that uh, wonderful ministry, you can go to our website or to treeoflives.com. We also want to um, lift up in Thanksgiving our fathers and all the father, father figures in our lives that continue to help us be purpose-driven and um, pull out the potential in our lives. So we pray for all the dads, and especially those dads that can't be with their families today. We want to um, just give a praise for the kickoff for our summer study and the parking lot party last week. So much fun and fellowship in our church family. And for new ventures of, uh, of ministry, we want to pray for the um, Urban Renewal Center as they start a new jail ministry to help folks who are getting out of jail transition into society again. If you're interested in that, you can come to a meeting this Wednesday, June 22nd at 6 in First Hall if you want to know more information. We want to continue to pray for Martha White and Chris McKinnon King and their treatments and prayers for healing for them. We also want to pray for those who continue to suffer with COVID. There's so many in our congregation and, of course, in our nation and around the world. And also um, a praise for uh, good decisions in our country. Um, today is a national holiday, Juneteenth. I think it's going to be observed tomorrow, where we celebrate um, the, the release of of slaves in our country, and what a wonderful opportunity for us to share that with, with our African American brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. We are so grateful for this day and for you calling us here. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to remind us of our purpose and gifts that are to be used for the glory of your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for, for being with those who are far away and for being with those who are very near to us. We pray, Lord, for those who are heavy on our hearts. We pray for healing, for wholeness, for those who are suffering, for those who are experiencing violence, for those who are displaced. We know, Lord, that you are in all those circumstances, and we pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our resources to respond to your call. To, to minister to this world that needs to know about you so very desperately and needs to see you in our living. We pray that as we continue to live our lives this day and throughout the week, that you would direct our paths. 
And we pray that you would hear us as we call on your name, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of forever. copies in the narthex at the back of the sanctuary or if you go through these doors where there's coffee and donuts and plenty of friendly people to talk to you can find the book there as well you don't have to sign up for anything volunteer shake a hand any of that you can just take it it's our gift to you one of the great joys and ways that we see christ in our family is to pray with and for one another and our prayer team has been praying for us throughout the service and they will be here afterwards by the communion table if you have something on your heart this morning please don't leave without praying with and having them pray for you. It would be a great blessing, I promise. Now today, as we go out and we consider and we seek to live an undistracted life, I hope that you hear this clearly and undistracted, that God has created you. Our loving God has created you with gifts, with talents, has blessed you abundantly with all kinds of good things. But they're not for you to hold on to. They're for you to give freely as you seek Christ and share his love. And so this morning, I would like to use Paul's words to the church in Colossia as our, our benediction, as Paul says, that whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.